The following is a member of the Burke Reviews podcast family. BurkeReviews.com Hey everybody, welcome to Burke Reviews Movie Club. I'm John Burke. And with me, as always, is my partner in crime, Corey Star. That's a great introduction. Hi, guys. I'm trying to get better. I got I do another podcast with uh, Matt Hudson from What I Watch Tonight. Co. Uk, and that dude gives the best intros. Um, he like hypes me up so much. I'm like, I feel like I'm nice. gonna bust through like a piece of paper, you know, and have a, a crowd. Uh, yes. But um, I'm gonna I'm gonna get better, Corey. I'm gonna do something more fun. I appreciate that. Thanks, Matt. Um, this is all because of you. <laughs> it is, uh, which is funny because he gives me credit for the reason he has his podcast. So you know, it's all cyclical. We're all just movie lovers who want to talk about movies as much as possible. Um, this is the podcast where Corey and I uh, basically are trying to watch more movies that we haven't seen, and uh, we encourage each other to do so by uh, picking movies weekly and then reviewing them on this episode. Um, if you've never listened before, welcome. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about City of God from 2003. Uh, it's a Brazilian film. Um, it's a tough film, I would say, in some ways. Very innovative film in other ways. Um, definitely going to be one that we're going to talk about in pretty great detail later in the episode. Um, before we do that, we like to catch up and talk about not only what we've been watching, but how we've been. So, Corey, how have you been? I'm fine. You know, I'm just learning a lot of things at work. And, you know, and I'm really excited Okay, I have to tell you something. Yes. So, first of all, I'm going to go. We're going to float the river tomorrow, so that's really great. And just send good vibes that we don't drown. It's the Boise River, so it's pretty chill, actually. Um, and next week, we're going to see Death Cab for Cutie, and that's on Friday. And then on Sunday, I think we're going to go to a cat film festival. So, I knew that they were doing this film festival to raise funds for, like, a local cat uh, Okay, that makes more sense. Or something. <laughs> but then my friend told me that you also get to cuddle kittens during the movie. Oh. So, A, that's amazing, because I'm a cat lady. But I might end up with a new, like, little kitten, you know? So, this could be very bad. Well, Corey, if you haven't seen Val Luton's The Cat People... Um, it's on my voodoo and I have to recommend that you check it out. Uh, and I really wish that your festival was going to only play movies that featured cats. I think that it might be. And okay. I think that they're doing a dog one too. Okay. But I mean, you get to sit in the theater and hold a cat while you watch a movie? Not to talk business on air, but one, I do want you to write a review of this film festival too. <laughs> Okay. Um, it's, it's just going to be like, purr, purr, purr. What? I love the I'm, cat. You know, a little more editorial, like, uh, what was it? What was it about? Uh, how did it go? Were people there? Um, was it distracting during the movie? Because I feel like it's going to be. Like, um, if you're cuddling a cat, I don't know how much you're paying attention yeah. to the film. Um, and if they're kittens, they might be a little wild. That's what I was thinking, too. Like, they probably won't sit still until they pass out of exhaustion, but... Um, but that that is fun. Uh, when you said a cat film festival, I needed an explanation. So thank you for providing one because it's to benefit the Idaho Humane Society, that is and there cool. is going to be a dog one too. So oh, it's called the New York Dog Film Festival and the New York Cat Film Festival. It's a medley of short films. Oh, interesting. So it probably will feature animals. Um, I'm sure since they're shorts, there's probably a, a good abundance of topics they could have picked from. Well, that's interesting. Um, I don't know if we do anything like that over here. That's kind of cool. Um, you mentioned that you've been working a lot, Corey. I actually, I went back to work kind of early this week. Um, yeah. Did you have agendas when you were in school? Uh, what like a, do like, you mean? Like a planner, like like a book, like a book that you call an agenda, or some people might just call it a planner, but like it has a calendar, but it also has other like information that students can use to keep organized. And Okay. In middle school and high school, I'm not the best at using those things. Okay, but you had one probably yes. provided by the school so we used to provide them we had in the last couple of years um and in the past i i have a um i am a jack of all trades master of none uh i have a, a degree in, in journalism so i have an editing background i am the yearbook uh coordinator at our school as well and i do teach students how to do this type of stuff so i get my skill sets calls for editing so um the 
the old agendas we've done, we we would have like 20 pages or so at the beginning of the book that were custom. So I would design those uh, at my principles. You know, she wants this, this, that, and I would just make it so it would fit in the book and, and you know, be legible and things like that. Um, and usually I'd have maybe two weeks to do like the 20 pages. Uh, this year we're switching companies and the company we're using provides nothing. What? Um, everything, every page in the agenda is, is built by me. Um, I built 133 pages, some of which built is unfair because they were like already created from the old agenda. I just had to repurpose or restructure. Um, but still, ultimately, I built with help. I did have a partner. Um, however, the way the program works, um, I still had everything she made. I had to then put into the pages, but she did help me tr tremendously. So I'm in no way short selling my partner. Um, it would have been torture if she had not been a part of this because it definitely... Uh, it, it made it bearable because it tedious i feel like like just a lot of little things it took uh, i think 27 hours in three days <gasps> um to to finish um and again that was uh some of it was waiting because like we would do something and i'd have to email it and get confirmation or uh, i needed things that i couldn't do myself like i needed an official bell schedule because we're changing our schedule slightly there's a lot of, you know a lot of stuff but it man it was tedious and it was um but you know, it was. It's not hard either. Like it's. It, it's something I'm. I am very familiar with uh, the software and the whole process and the general idea. Um, but I, I'm pretty proud of it in some ways, though, because you know, like all of my student population is going to have this book, and I will have had my input on every single one of the pages in the book. So it is kind of like, wow, that's crazy. Um, you know, again, it's not like it's a book book, but it's still like it's something when you make it's something cool. and then you're going to see it all over the place. It is kind of. It's kind of crazy, you know. It's again, an accomplishment. It is a sense of it's a small accomplishment, but nonetheless, like I've done other stuff too. Like, and it's all local. Like, there was a couple of billboards that I designed for the the charter system that were up, and that was kind of like a drive by. Like, I made that, um, you know. <laughs> oh no, yeah. Um, I, I did a commercial for a local uh, cell phone repair company that that played in front of movies at our uh, one of our what? theaters. Yeah, and so that was That's really so cool. Rad. It wasn't in like the trailer section, but you know, like in the the stuff before the movie yeah, starts. We're yeah, the local yeah. businesses can advertise. Yeah, every time I would be in the theater, like, I made that. Those of you in the theater, I made that. I designed that. Um, <laughs> the two of you here got really, who got here really early. Yeah, yes, exactly. I'm, like, the only <laughs> one in the theater, like, hey, I made that. Okay, well. Um, but, yeah, so, like, those little things, uh, again, nothing big, but those are things that I never planned on doing. Like, I never planned on designing billboards or making commercials. So, like, the fact that I've done that in my other because i've still done all of my other jobs too so it's just one of those weird things again i am a, a jack of all trades master of none um i'm trying to be a master of movies which is why we do this podcast so i love how you just reel that in that's again i'm a master podcaster um <laughs> i would like to talk about what we've been watching now Corey, you said you haven't seen much oh, since our last recording no. i ended up working overtime instead of going to the movie <laughs> so Mm. that's that i've been watching some true blood when i'm able to and this movie was long so i'm working until seven and then it takes me 30 minutes almost to get home and then having the grocery shop or like do laundry or other things Corey, so i had to break it into two movies yes. over life every time remember that i don't know oh. i kind of have to i kind of i can't be having no dirty house <laughs> I, can't. I i don't want your excuses uh no uh I'll bye everyone i i've seen a lot of movies this week as per usual um I, this month i've been pretty good about not missing a day i did miss a day but then i watched two in one day to make up for it so it all balances out but um uh since we last recorded i saw won't you be my neighbor again for the third time fourth time Oh, third time, third time. Um, we've we've talked since I saw it, but we have not talked on this podcast since I saw it, um, because I took my wife and daughter and my daughter's friend to go see it at Polk Theater. Um, my wife cried so much she got a migraine. Um, uh, oh damn! I was just crying the whole time. I cried more the most the third time, uh, partly because I was anticipating moments that I knew made me cry, and so I started tearing up earlier <laughs> before they happened thinking I about it was them coming in 33 minutes <laughs> yeah wasn't that specific but yes um uh, no no uh, definitely for sure uh that kind of thing um i mentioned this on top five movies but i watched all the president's men uh for the first time and i love love that movie so so much i am so mad at myself for not having watched it earlier um i've been like i don't know putting it off for whatever reason um 
I figured I would like it. I just hadn't made the effort. Uh, it is 138 minutes, so it's a little long, but it did not feel particularly long. Really, really, really liked that movie. Um, I then went uh, after we recorded. I saw that before we recorded. After we recorded, I jumped in my truck and went and saw Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again. And how was that? You know what? Lily James makes the movie fantastic. I, fantastic Strong. It's really fun. I enjoyed it way more than I enjoyed the first one. Um, and it's mainly because of Lily James, because she is fantastic. I I just can't wait for her to do more movies. Everything I've seen her in, and I've seen her in most of her big roles, um, even one of her indie films from this year, uh, in uh, Little Woods, with her and Tessa Thompson, I saw at Tribeca, which I thought was great. Um, she's just a terrific actress. Uh, the next night, I went and saw Unfriended Dark Web. I really liked this movie, Corey. Um, did you Did you I, see the first one? I hate the first one. Very okay. much. Um, may, hate might be strong. I may have over-disliked it in time. I was not really into it when I watched it the first time. I think the biggest mistake they went is having a movie set on a computer screen um, going supernatural in the first movie. This movie is grounded in reality. It deals with hackers and the dark web much more realistic and much more sensible to be on a computer screen as a result you know like makes sense now why we're all in a computer the entire movie because it's hackers that's their world we're in their world it's it induced me with so much paranoia <laughs> i walked <laughs> i walked out of the theater uh kind of in dread and like how much of that is true and also like a I was not comfortable googling any of it because i did i feel like all of it would flag me by the fbi or cia so um really compelling uh good good performances from predominantly an unknown cast um i thought it worked uh, the ending's a little off it, it gets a little you know tropish towards the end but overall i had a good time with the movie and matt agrees we both uh we just talked about that movie extensively um i rewatched mission impossible rogue nation um in preparation for the sixth film because i realized that the fifth film is uh very much connected to the sixth film more so than any of the other ones in the franchise um we have two recurring characters uh, reoccurring characters that were not a part of the imf team so i went ahead and rewatched rogue nation i really like that movie um i went and saw eighth grade uh at a critic screening i got to bring my daughter and my wife to that um i enjoyed it the second time as much as the first if not maybe a little more um they liked it i was i feel like they didn't get as enthusiastically love about it as i did but you know um not everyone's gonna click on everything the same uh there's a few things i think being a teacher also helps me with this movie because i feel like um it represents the age so perfectly um but um last night uh, my daughter and i went and saw mission impossible fallout uh, i loved fallout so much it's so good if you are a fan of mission impossible at all you will very much love this movie. Um, if you're not, uh, I think you can still love it. Matt went in kind of not being a huge f uh, fan of the Mission Impossible franchise. Loved this movie. Thinks it might be the best movie of the year. Um, so, yeah, uh, that said. And then today, um, between recording two podcasts, I watched City of God this morning. Um, it is a little long, but it's not that long. In fact, Mission Impossible Fallout's two and a half hours. <laughs> City of God's just over two hours. So, um, but all in all, that's what I've watched this week, um, including a couple of episodes of Friends, and that's, I don't think I've watched anything else. I literally think that's, it's been movies, Friends, and a few podcasts. I've listened to a few things this week, but um, I didn't have time to watch any other shows. I really want to watch Glow Season 2 on Netflix. Um, I was a big fan of the first season, and I just, uh, my wife liked the first season, but just seems not interested in watching the second. And I've heard the second is so much better, which is exciting to me. And um, I am I think I'm just going to end up watching it without her, uh, especially because I think Orange is the New Black comes back this week. And she's a super fan of that. And I've kind of gotten tired of that show. Um, I just don't know. I just don't know. I have not been. And also, like, I just why do I want to watch a bunch of people stuck in prison? Well, Oz was, I thought Oz was a great show, um, and that was, a, I think, a tougher show than, like, because Orange is the New Black has some humor, um, Oz had, like, no humor, that was a very dark show, um, but uh, Orange is the New Black was, I think it was really good early, I think at this point it's kind of jumped the shark and it's gone 
overboard. Now it, it seems like it tried to ground it itself uh, two seasons ago, and I was already kind of checked out. And I just I don't even know. I can't remember if I watched last season or not. So I'm um, I'm kind of done. Uh, I am looking forward to Glow season two. Um, and there's some other stuff out there I've been meaning to catch up on show wise, but I just haven't. Um, that said, I think that's all for what we've been watching because Corey didn't get a chance to watch anything. Let's watch some True Blood, guys. That could have been a movie, Corey. I... Well, I can't <laughs> watch a movie and fold laundry or okay. clean. I was okay. Gonna, I thought you were gonna say just because of time, though, because you do like to. You're you're not opposed to stopping and starting a movie later, um, mm-hmm. which I prefer not to do. Although I did have to stop City of God several times today because um, I was also making uh, ribs in the oven, um, which uh, you know slow cooking ribs in the oven takes a little bit of. You have to check on them every once in a while, make sure everything's going smoothly, which they did turn out pretty well. A little too much salt on my part, but other than that, they came out pretty well. Um, and also, uh, to take notes for this movie, I had to pause it because of the subtitles. So, like, whenever I wanted to take a note, I had to, like, pause, take the note, and replay. So it took a little longer than the two-hour and ten-minute runtime um, to get through. But not because uh, it wasn't compelling or anything, which um, I think let's get into the stats for City of God. Um, City of God came out in 2002. Uh, it had a kind of interesting release, though, because if I'm not mistaken, it was nominated... Um, Brazil put it up for its foreign film nomination in 2003, and it did not get the nomination, which then made it eligible in the 2004 Oscars as an American release, and it got several nominations. It was uh, nominated for Best Director, um, Best Writing, Adapted Screenplay, Best Cinematography, and Best Film Editing um, in 2004. So the movie came out in 2002, but because it wasn't officially released in America until later, um, it did get nominated in the 2004 Oscars. Um, Uh, the plot summary, two boys growing up in a violent neighborhood of Rio de Janeiro take different paths. One becomes a photographer, the other a drug dealer. Um, directed by Fernando Mir... Yep, should have looked this up. Mireles and, uh, Katia Lund. Um, I'm not gonna read, uh, much of the cast because for the most part, these were not actors. I wanna say something though, and I might say his name incorrectly as well, Mm -hmm. but Sue George? Sue... Or, I don't know. A but musician, we, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't realize um, who he was in this movie because I've only seen him in, uh, oh my gosh, The Life Aquatic. Yep. With Steve Zuso. Mm-hmm. So that was interesting. I didn't even realize. And I think he's wearing like a hat or like a beanie or something in that movie. And I don't know if you really see his face that much, actually. Well, he's one of but, the crew, right? So yeah, he's wearing a beanie because that's the uniform in um, mm-hmm. Life Aquatic. But. Here he's got a uh, big hair. Knockout. Um, yeah. yeah, and uh, yeah, uh, knockout Ned is the American name, although his name was um, Chicken Man or something. The actual translation, but in Brazil that means that he was like a, a womanizer. Uh, so like knockout here is just like he's good looking. He's the good looking one. Um, yeah, most of the cast is non actors. They were uh, people from. The, I believe the actual City of God. I did some reading on this uh, on a few different websites trying to... Because it is based on a true story, but it's one of those... I don't know how Let's much see. is... Yeah, how much is uh, exaggerated. Um, the guy who plays Carrot is an actual actor. Um, and I obviously, Sue George is a musician slash actor. Um, but most of the rest of the cast are just guys from the village that they taught to act uh, enough. In, like They had like a workshop for like three months before they filmed. Um, Alexandre Rodriguez, uh, Leandro Firmino, um, Douglas Silva, and Jonathan Hagginson all have pictures on IMDb implying that maybe they've gone on to acting careers outside of this movie, but it is my understanding that this would have been their first film, um, from what I've read. And yeah, uh, they do have some other credits. Um, I had heard about this film, and this is, uh, we didn't mention this was our last movie uh, under the coming of age story or uh, theme for the month of July, and um, it's definitely it has coming of age elements. Although it is uh, in a gangster movie, um, it's not a traditional coming of age story in that way, which is a good thing I think in in a lot of ways. Um, but I had uh, one of my students who's now a graduate and is actually going to college at my alma mater. Um, 
had really pushed that I watch this movie when I was doing the challenge in 2016 when I was watching a movie a day for the entire year and I bought it then and I just never got to it partly because of the two hour and ten minute runtime um, that year was feeling very hectic and I started picking movies that were shorter um, to fit in with like doing my homework for my master's degree and stuff like that and, and finding time to write the reviews and stuff so I was picking movies that were under two hours on the average so this movie just kept getting pushed back and obviously two years later I finally watched it um, and I would say I, I I really liked it it's really it's 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 crazy uh, a lot of the film choices are very unique some of the like the opening sequence is um, the way they edit it where it's like we're like flashing into the movie like it's a guy sharpening a knife but we're only on it for like half a second and then the screen goes black and it comes back it's jarring and it kind of I think sets the tone for what you're going to go through with the rest of the movie because so much of it is jarring and shocking and um, to hear that there there are many aspects of this film that are a true story is horrifying um, the conditions that these people are living in alone is kind of rough and hard to, to deal with especially when you think of um you know lower class america we think oh how tough it is and it's like mm, it's not nearly as tough as what these kids are going through and then to see what they do um it wasn't as heavy a movie as i thought it was going to be though same um because of the subject matter like i expected like we we have kids with guns doing horrible things but um and they they don't shy away from the violence too much. Um, some of it does happen like off camera, uh, in a, in a strategically probably very good choice by the directors um, to do it off camera the way they did it. But other scenes are there, there's you know there's blood there's some some very strong visuals put into the movie uh, to to get the violence across. But still, it never felt as heavy as like let's say like train spotting which has some really traumatic scenes that deal with some young individuals those scenes like weigh on you and you walk away just devastated um i i don't know like there's a couple scenes i can think of that maybe should have had that feeling and i don't i don't think they did and i don't know if that's because of like i was i kept pausing it and i was distracted at times even though the, i i never missed anything in the movie like i watched the movie from beginning to end screen in front of me i just had to keep pausing it and you watched it also in that uh, not quite maybe as fragmented as i had but you did take like you said two or three days to watch this right i did so i don't know if maybe that affected our uh the weight of what happened or maybe it's the the attitude that the characters have is that this is just how it is and so there isn't this like there there is there's no weight really to their actions yeah i don't i don't know because i feel like that sounds so bad but they don't have consequences that we would expect which i think makes it heavier when you look at it like that like these kids are so desensitized to what they're doing that they don't even care that they're doing it like there's a few moments of um genuine sadness i guess that happens but even that it's it's moved so quickly yeah it's like okay next um and we'll talk about that more in spoilers because those are definitely spoiler moments but um what is your initial impression of city of god Corey? Uh, i totally agree you told me that i needed to pretty much pace myself and sometimes i have a really hard time watching some things um so i was expecting it to weigh on me a lot more than it did and i feel like saying that makes it seem like i'm not a human or that i don't i don't know it, it is a confusing feeling because i the student that recommended this movie to me definitely um definitely was more emotionally affected by it uh and again i don't like i'm not desensitized to this i think it's awful um i think just how it's presented like i was because you're the whole movie's told by the narrator rocket who is our uh, you could say he's the main character but really he's like an ancillary character who just happens to be our entry point into the story because most of the story isn't about him like he gets he's there things happen around him he's the photographer that was mentioned in the uh plot summary but for the most part it's not like following him the whole movie or yeah. and, and seeing he, everything from his perspective yeah he he doesn't have he doesn't affect much of the plot he's more or less like 
uh, an observer, which makes sense because again, he's a photographer, which is a observer. Um, he does affect it some ways. Like there are moments that he might sway things in one direction or another, but for the most part, he's just an observer like us. And I think that detachment is part of what I'm feeling too, that he's not going through the emotional things. Cause even the, there's a couple of things that happen in the movie that should emotionally affect him more, but it seems like he's either unaware of them and we know, or he, when he found out to when we're hearing the story, he's grown past it. It's just part of what happens. Um, and again, I feel like that's true for a lot of what happens in this movie is a lot of times these guys are so hung up on other things and they say this at one point too in the movie that they're not affected emotionally um they're so detached and so desensitized to violence and drugs and everything around them and to uh just how like institutionalized the crime has become in this area um that there's no law you know uh so much so that a criminal becomes kind of a hero uh, to the villagers for a while, and that's that's sad and shocking, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you liked it overall. Yeah, I don't know if I'll need to ever watch it again, but there's some really cool stuff. I think visually, um, some of the choices they make with the the camera work and with the editing um, that I would use to teach. I don't think I would teach the whole film. Uh, there is a scene with that involves a lot of sex, but it's not. Even how the filmmaker shows it, you barely see the sex. Like, you're aware that it's there, but it's not focused on the nudity or anything. Um, I think there's a couple of, like... even I feel like the shots are far away or out of focus on a lot of the, the people who are nude. Um, and there is a reference to a rape at one point, but even that's... Done, that's video, cinematographically, cinematographically very tame. Um, we know it happens, but it's all off-camera. Uh, there's a couple of close-ups that I think are edited in such a way that gives you the impression but without showing anything too graphic um so done tastefully i guess is which is a weird thing to say but i you know it's not exploitative at all of the of the sequence it is um probably done the best way you could do it without showing it and i think that's good so i could see using this for that um but yeah i don't know that i would rewatch this um just for pleasure purposes uh but that said, Corey, let's get into spoilers. Dun, dun, dun. Guys, from here on, we're going to talk about this movie in great detail. You can go, you know, watch it or full steam ahead. Um, so, Corey, what, uh, what do you want to focus on first? Um, the absolute, total, complete disregard of human life in this movie. Yeah. Uh, it is. Like, I, I just, I, and I think that also when we start looking at another character, and I'm so bad with their names because I just felt like it was all happening so much, and I was having to read so much, and because they talk a lot in this movie, holy heck! And there were a couple times I had to rewind just so I could listen, like read the subtitles because I missed some. Because it's just oh. like da 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 da. Um, but I think that. I think that it's a good reprise. I think that it really does a good job of showing that you can't you can't go in guns ablazing and take over and then not expect to have the same consequences yourself. Yeah, um, for sure. I mean that. I think that's the lesson. It's very much uh, from what I read. I read a few different articles, but um, they definitely point out like the similarities to story uh, from like Goodfellas. Um, and like a Scorsese kind of gangster film that this movie is, uh, what's scary about that is that it's kids. It's all, I mean, they never say specific ages, but the impression I get is that, um, little, little dice and or little Zay as he becomes later in the film, um, would be no older than like 25. I think that at one time they do say that he's 18. Oh, wow. Do they? Okay. I might've missed that. Um, cause it is subtitles and I, I they do talk a bit uh i feel like more than a lot of other foreign films that i've seen and they speak so rapidly because everything is happening so fast in the movie yeah that it's just kind of hard to keep up with so i might have missed that but yeah i I still knew he's still he's a kid in my eyes you know and yeah and he's basically ruling the city 
or the city of God, the slums, the ghetto of Rio de Janeiro, where the, uh, the poor people have basically been relegated to live. Um, they have almost no police protection. The police are corrupt. Uh, we see multiple times and multiple examples of that. Um, it's set primarily in the 60s and 70s. Uh, it starts, I, th I guess, like at the end of the 70s, but uh, we flash back to the 60s. Um, and we again, we focus around a character named Rocket, uh, who is our photographer, which until the end of the movie, he doesn't have a whole lot of impact on the main plot. He's just telling us all these different characters' stories, including Little Dice, um, Shaggy, uh, his uh, Rocket's brother, um, uh, ooh, I forgot his name, Goose, and then um, their friend Clipper, which is the first group that we get, uh, Shaggy, Clipper, and Goose, and the uh, their gang that kind of falls apart really quick after they listen to Little Dice's suggestion that they rob a hotel, um, which the, the film does this really cool thing because they leave the hotel and we saw them like tie some people up and they pointed guns at people and they hit some people and it, they were they were awful, but they just stole stuff. They didn't kill anybody. But after they leave the hotel, it cuts back to the inside of the hotel and there's a bunch of dead people. And it, the way and, they show it, it's really quick too. Yeah, and I... Cause, I don't know. I think that it, it's obviously on a completely different level when you go in and rob someone and then when you murder them and it's just, mm -hmm. you're just taking their money. Why do you need to kill them too? Um, and then when we find out what really happened, I was like, holy shiitake. Yeah. And I was pretty sure that they had not killed anybody because they didn't show that. Yeah. Uh, but they didn't show how they died either. But then we get... Um, yeah, we see uh, that later on in the film that Little Dice went in and killed them all, which I kind of thought was the case. Um, and I also thought that maybe he killed Goose, which we do also find out. Um, I still don't which know. I didn't think that because he's like eight. <laughs> yeah, but he's clearly a sociopath. Um, yeah. We see him kill with almost blatant disregard through most of the film, which, of course, is interesting because when he takes over the city, he does create a no kill rule. Um that his his point though is that he's trying to keep the cops out and so anytime anybody does any petty crime outside of the drug dealing it brings the cops in and then they have to like enforce the law um when they when they just stay away he can rule with an iron fist and he's making tons of money on the drug sales um so it, uh he does have this kind of sense of irony and order that um you know he stops people from doing holdups which was where a lot of the other crime was happening and that's where a lot of things go wrong uh, interesting, the the runts, which is the group of kids that are kind of living uh, without rules. They're holding up, they're robbing like bakeries and things like that. Um, Little Zay gets very mad about that, and um, yeah, that uh, they that group of kids, which later kill Little Zay in a pretty horrific way, right? Like they like all shoot him. Is it so bad that I was just like sweet justice? Well. It, it's a little bad because that that group of runts is apparently the like, same thing. No, in real life, they're like the biggest cartel in Rio de Janeiro right now. Like Holy sh they that group of kids is based on real people who have like taken over. And th when they're walking away after they kill him, they say something about like a death list. And apparently, that's like a real thing that this cartel has is like a death list of people that if you if you betray them, they put you on their list to kill you. Um, <laughs> And I don't know, if, I feel like I read Cartel, if I'm wrong, maybe it's Mafia, Mob, Organization, Gang, I don't know what the right term is. I don't know when something becomes a cartel and not uh, a gang or whatever. Like, I don't know what those distinctions are. I don't know if they're all interchangeable words. Um, I am definitely not an expert on mobster gang movies or real life gangs and movies. Um, or, sorry, gangs and mobsters and things like that. So, if I'm using the wrong term, I apologize. But apparently, that, real people. That um, scene, though, when they, like take those kids and they corner them and then they have one of the little kids oh. in their gang just like oh what did they ask is that the same part where they ask where do you want to be shot in your foot or your hand yeah, and then they shoot part. them where they don't want to be shot and then um and then they, they, they make they, the kid called steak fries who runs with little zay uh shoot one of them to prove like basically to initiate him into the gang even though he's very very young too he's not as young as the kids he shoots but and he's still really young. I just don't understand. And this is what I don't understand about a lot of things in life. 
even in America. <laughs> so excuse me. But how are you not going to have enough money to eat or have a decent house, but everybody owns a damn gun? Well, um, we see it's kind of the crime thing, I guess. Uh, we see them hold up a gun store at one point. Um, That's the only time that it made any sense. Well, I mean, but like you said, though, it, it seems to be a real thing. Criminals have weapons. Um, and you could, and, I mean, you could go purge here and think maybe that those guns are being provided to them by the rich so that they'll kill each other um, in a way. I mean, it's definitely not out of the line of question that it happens, but um, who knows for sure. Uh, uh, and then also, like, something else that I noticed, like, these guys and these people are so worried about being drugs and living the good life. But they really still weren't living the good life. They still lived in their homes were no better. They they did nothing was any better. No, and Zay, I think Zay's story is uh, in a way the most tragic because he has all the power, quote unquote, but um, has no friends, no real friends. Uh, his best friend Benny um, is ready to leave him. Uh, says he's tired of it and unfortunately is murdered. Um, which I love the scene when he gets Rocket the camera that the girl too the girl that Rocket had a crush on that he lost to Benny. I also I I got I liked s- Benny. I like Benny a lot, but I also like that. Um, I like how Rocket handled things because that in any other movie the fact that Benny took the girl would have made Rocket hate him or resentful, and he's never that way. He's always like, "Crap, I lost my chance." It's like, you know, like the most calm and rational reaction to that that a person could have like you know he was a little jealous but he didn't like blame benny he didn't hate benny and benny wasn't a dick to him neither was her uh, old boyfriend um i forget his name now tiago or something like that tiago i think yeah he was never even he was never mean to to rocket or the girl like as bad as they are <laughs> in many places like rocket's never really bad rocket attempts to be bad and can't even do it like he's he, it's i love that scene when he like he's gonna rob the bus and he can't he's gonna rob the bakery and he can't and they're like but he's such a nice guy but he lives in the city of god yeah it, he's you know um you can't you can't dislike rocket he doesn't Which, do anything really wrong i think that they also show that once you head down that path there's no turning back and you're not going to stick to your you know whatever supposed morals you have yeah and benny is the one's questionable story with that though right because benny went early with little with little dice like he was around when dice was killing all the bad guys and it's implied that benny killed some too like benny's not a good guy but chooses to leave the life but i think the movie says that you can't you know once you're in the life you're always a target um because even, with knockout ned well it, it had nothing to do with you know knockout ned shows up after this right because zay oh, i know i'm saying yeah. though that he oh. tries to act like he's not going to have a part in certain things that, that there are going to be rules and then that was a couple of the biggest shock in the movie to me was the um the kid otto that we otto comes to get a gun and says he wants to kill the man who murdered his father um, and then I we felt like there was something off. Yeah, me too. Because he, the way he was acting, right, and um, and you could tell that Ned felt like it was off too. Well, I think Ned didn't like the idea of giving a kid a gun. Um, Ned, Ned is trying so hard to cling to civility. Um, although he he does leave it, you know, like you said, once you go down that path, it's impossible to separate. And the movie says that too. I mean, we get that kind of the first time Carrot saves his life by killing somebody. Um. Well, the first time he stops Carrot from killing somebody and Carrot agrees. The second time Carrot kills somebody who's about to shoot Ned. Ned's grateful. The third time Ned kills somebody. And so you see this like progression into that lifestyle where his his original rule was no killing to okay, I guess it's okay to kill if someone's going to kill me. But that that kill that he does there the third time in that sequence comes back at the end when we find out that Otto was at the bank that day. That was Otto's dad was a security guard and he has been waiting to kill Ned and he already tried once uh, shooting Ned in the in the side. That was nuts. And I liked that they didn't show us. Yeah. Who shot him because I just assumed it was one of. Yeah, it made perfect sense. It wasn't like, why would someone shoot him? It made perfect sense in the moment that he got shot. You were almost like, why are you just standing there, dude? You're in the middle of a gang war. Like, how are you not dead? Um, and then, yeah, that Otto ends up taking him out later. Um, I mean, there's so many things that play. I, I love that um, 
you know, Benny gets the camera for Rocket, but then Lil Zay intervenes and he doesn't get the camera. And then later, Lil Zay's jealous because Ned's in the paper and nobody's talking about Lil Zay, so he wants a picture taken. And Diego goes, I have a friend who takes pictures. Here comes Rocket. He gives the camera to Rocket. And I love that he even says, Benny wanted you to have it. Because Zay always seems like he is oblivious to Rocket. Like, he has no clue. Like, they've never met, but they've met several, several times. Um, and yet, he'll then he'll say his name. But he'll act like he doesn't know who he is. And they'll be like, Rocket, blah, blah, blah. But Rocket takes his picture. The picture gets published in the paper. Rocket's freaking out. But the whole time, Zay's loving it. Zay's excited that he's in the paper. Like, feels recognized. Um, and I, I thought that was kind of a cool, like, kind of twist. And then the uh, the journalism that we see him do, where he like sneaks and gets pictures of the cops um, taking bribes, and then he sees the the kids kill him, kill Zay, and then the pictures of Zay bloody in on the street. Like, it's a crazy way to end the movie, but it you know it's kind of where we saw it coming. That opening shot too, because the movie starts at the end, and we flash back. But I love how they do it, like where um, rockets in between the cops and the gangsters. And the camera like circles him and like he's like clearly panicked doesn't know do i stay right here do i run to the left or right what do i do um and i i thought it was cool how it like spun into him being a goalie back in the 60s and that's where the story really kind of gets going um and, and i we... forgot about that until they went back to it at the end ah well probably because i mean you you stopped it like twice so you know no just once oh just once okay well still you had a day to forget that i don't blame you because it does it doesn't cut back and forth well, happens it like, does it does and we once we jump backwards we don't come back until we come back like once we get to it at the end it doesn't cut back and forth um we start there because who cool. Yeah, and it is a lot because there's all these different storylines that are intertangled like we meet characters and he's like it's not time for his story yet and you never like like he does that with Shorty at the beginning of the movie, and you don't get a full story for Shorty. You just get the part of the story that involves the trio, where um, Goose is sleeping with Shorty's wife. Shorty catches them. Goose runs, and that's ironically when he gets killed by Little Dice. But then uh, Shorty kills his wife, and Shorty goes to jail. Um, <laughs> that was so nuts. It was that so nuts. A whole scene where he's like he like doesn't he hit his wife? What does he hit his wife a with? A shovel. With a shovel? Yeah. In their house, and then he just starts digging up their dirt floor, and he buries her alive. Apparently. Yeah, which I'm not sure. Like I'm like, are you sure she wasn't dead? Because he hit her in the head with a shovel. Like. Well, I think that they would be able to tell after autopsy if she had like true. dirt in her lungs. They did say he buried her alive, so you're, that is what the movie says. I was just surprised. Um. I don't know how she'd be alive after that because holy heck and then like ned too ned was the bus driver but, was he yeah yeah not that ned is the bus driver and that's when, when we meet him he says we're gonna get his story later and we do um his story is probably the second biggest story once he shows up uh i would say it's little zay's movie really rocket is our our entry point and we do get an arc for rocket but for the most part it's everything happening around Rocket. Rocket's just kind of there to, to see it and watch it and tell us about it. But um, when Ned's story kicks off, his girlfriend is raped. Um, and for some reason, Zay they doesn't make him kill watch. him. They make him watch. And then he doesn't kill him. He shoots, like, the ground next to him. And then there's kind of... There's some weird humor in this movie. Because um, Zay's like... We cut to... I think uh, Ned says, I don't know why he didn't kill me. And then it cuts to Zay. He's like, hey, hold on why didn't I kill him? And like turns around and goes to rectify his mistake. It's like a weird comedic twist. And they shoot up the house. They kill uh, his brother and his uncle. Ned survives. And then um, it becomes a revenge story for Ned. And he ends up joining Carrot, who was the like rival drug dealer in the slums. Well, they uh, had gone, little Zay uh, had gone through and taken over all the other slums, but had left Carrot's. And I can't mm -hmm. remember exactly why he said he left Carrot. I didn't. I thought they said he killed Carrot, and then Carrot showed up. So I was really confused at that point. Um, no, so, they said that they were leaving him alone, but I can't remember why. Now that we're talking about it, yeah. So I don't know what the reason was because they took over most of the other stuff. They didn't kill Blackie. They shot Blackie, and then they didn't kill him. Um, but they took the apartment from him, and so I just assumed because well, I think he just like, you know. Which, but that, Blackie's the one who ends up killing um, Benny. So, um, another mistake on Zay's part. Um, yeah, but uh, 
Rocket's story is the the hero story. He's the only one who kind of gets out alive. All of the other characters that we w- were introduced to die. Um, Ned dies. All of the trio dies. Um, actually, I guess we don't know if uh, I guess um, Clipper doesn't die because he went back to God though. Um, so we never see him again though. He goes. We know he goes back to the church, but we never see him again that I'm aware of. Um, little Dice and who becomes Little Zay dies. Uh, Ned dies. Um, even steak, steak fries or steak and fries, whatever they call him, um, he he dies unfortunately because he's a young kid. He's the one who killed the uh, the runt. The runts take over uh, at the end apparently, um, and uh, uh, from what I've read in real life, they are uh, uh, in charge still. Um, Benny dies. We don't know what happens to the girlfriend after Benny dies though. If she ends up like running away or staying in the city, we never see her again. Uh, Tiago, who is becoming a really bad uh, cokehead, dies. Um, I mean, basically everybody dies except for Rocket, who we are then told his name is Wilson Rodriguez um, at the end of the movie. Uh, I've, I've not looked up anything. I was trying to. I didn't get to look up any like actual um, like who in the movie were based on real people and who were like just fictionalized. Uh, they do show an interview with the apparent real like Ned. That they did that. Yeah, and it's like verbatim the interview they did in the movie too, which is kind of cool. Um, but that's the only thing they show. Usually, we would have got more stuff. I think um, they show pictures. If I if I I watched it on Netflix, and Netflix likes to cut away from the credits, so I had to like go back and like tell it to show me the credits. Um, but I think the pictures they showed were the the character and the real person, like the movie character and then the real person. I'm not sure if I'm right on that, but I think that's what they were doing. I think so remember now but um yeah I, I thought you know the movie looked really good uh there's a bunch of cool editing choices and and structure wise the storytelling is really compelling um i did i like the narration i don't always like narrated films but i thought the narration worked really well with the way they're telling the stories um i think any if they hadn't had it it would have been very very confusing to keep up with all the different storylines i think yes. Rock, rocket being kind of our storyteller helps keep it uh together so um i i think i'm i'm done i'm ready to rate the movie unless you got anything else you want to discuss Mm. we'll rate it and then i'll think of something (laughs) all right um as per usual uh i i feel like this film should be seen and it's got a lot of really cool filmmaking techniques so i i'm gonna go with must see and i think that it's a compelling story too yeah um I was definitely interested the whole time. For sure, I'm yeah. Gonna go with the same. It's definitely it's super tragic um, to think that these kids are exposed to this. You know, like this is uh, their life that they're just killing and everything and. Uh, why? Because you're not really getting any further ahead. None too. of them are getting out, right? Like, and most of them die before they become adults. Yeah. And we see like it's very rare to see kids holding guns. Um, in fact, uh, one of the things I read was that the the DVD box art, um, the original one for in Brazil, is a bunch of kids pointing guns at the camera, like that the picture that Rocket oh. takes at the end. And the mm-hmm. American release, they digitally removed all the guns, and they're just pointing fingers at the camera. Like, what? Gun fingers. Because um, while we are not opposed to violence in American cinema, uh, the idea of kids perpetrating it does bother people here. Um and so yeah it got it got digitally removed and i i'm not surprised um but it is it was crazy seeing like the kids holding the guns and like some of it made it kind of scarier because of, like like the kid playing little dice was way too happy <gasps> shooting yeah. the guy. like yeah. it was it was terrifying and just a lot of times just so nonchalant <laughs> yeah yeah he had no i mean even when um there's a part where uh the kind of replacement to Benny is, I think, Tuba or something like that. Um, for little Zay, it's like his now his number two is Tuba or something. And um, they both got hurt in the arm. And the guy's just, like, running his mouth. And and he just shoots him in the face. Oh, yeah, just boom. No, and like, he just, shut up. Yeah, you talk too much. And that's that's it. He walks away. Doesn't even doesn't care. Just killed his, like, number two guy. And keeps walking. You, know, in you the just middle, can't. A sociopath is the only phrase that I can come up with. Um, yeah, so super crazy. Uh, that 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 makes the movie crazy. But yeah, Corey and I give it a must see. It is a tough watch. It is available on Netflix for sure. 
I think it might also be on Prime. I'm not sure if that's accurate, but uh, feel free to check it out if you haven't already seen it. Um, but let's look ahead to next month and then specifically next week. Uh, next month, we are watching uh, school movies because I go back to school, kids go back to school. Um, and so we thought, what better than to watch movies that are focused around school or school life? So this isn't necessarily, these could kind of cross over with coming of age. Um, some of these might, but our focus was on school films. So Corey gets first pick, and I am so excited. <laughs> Good. Do you know what movie? You haven't seen this one either, have you? Oh, my gosh. more. Corey, are you kidding? This is my favorite Wes Anderson movie. Oh, is it? Is yeah. it the one that I bought you? No. no. You bought me Bottle Rocket, uh, which is his first okay. movie. This is Wes Anderson's first big release, though, is uh, Rushmore. Uh, it's the first one that has Bill Murray in it. Um, oh. Jason Schwartzman gets his start here. Uh, you do have Luke Wilson in it as well. Um, I forget the uh, the lead actress's name, but um, this movie is a, a favorite of mine, in fact. Um, so I'm very excited to rewatch it. One, because I love it. Uh, two, because I can't wait to talk to you about it, because I can't believe you haven't seen it. Um, one of the things I did during my uh, 366 challenge was I, I did watch every Wes Anderson film that I had not seen. So um, I've seen all of his films at this point, and I am a fan. Um, a big I would say a big fan of Wes Anderson. I need to rewatch a couple. I need to rewatch World of Tenenbaums, um, which I really want to get Criterion, I and I keep putting it off. I love Gwyneth Paltrow in that movie. I, I love that movie, and I, I just want to rewatch it. I think the first time I saw it, I wasn't quite where I'm at cinematically uh, thinking, and I'd like to rewatch it now. And then um, I loved Budapest Hotel when I saw Grand Budapest Hotel when I saw it, and I, I haven't rewatched it, and I keep wanting to. I just haven't. But I've seen Rushmore, I'd, I want to say, like, five times. Um, oh, it's, yeah. it's a movie I, I really, really love, Corey. I, you know I'm a big Bill Murray fan. Um, I would say this is in my top five Bill Murray movies, uh, with the obvious being, like, Ghostbusters and Groundhog Day being in the top two. This one is definitely in the top five, though. I, I love Bill Murray in this film. Um, he's not playing his normal goofy character the whole time, but Jason Schwartzman is a powerhouse in this movie. And um, I, I remember seeing the trailer for this even when I was a kid. And then uh, they did, um, for the MTV Movie Awards that year, all the little short, like, they you know, on the MTV Movie Awards, they always, like, recreate scenes from movies. Mm -hmm. um, they the year that this movie came out, they had, uh, his character's name is Max, and he, one of the many, many things he does in the movie is he writes plays, so they had him rewrite all the short stories, like, in character, so Schwartzman as Max rewrite all the little scenes, so, like, it's his play group, it's the actors from Rushmore recreating the scenes, those are all on YouTube, so after you watch the movie, you might want to check some of those out, because it'll be, like, whatever year this came out, I forget now, but, um, it's all the the big movies from that year recreated with like Wes Anderson's kind of sensibility, uh, so it's really funny. But um, yeah, we're gonna be watching Rushmore. I don't know if it's available to stream for free anywhere. Uh, it is available on all digital platforms to rent and or buy. I say it's a blind buy. If you're uh, if you're hearing this before the end of well, no, I think the Criterion Collection goes into the middle of August this year. Um, oh, so I thought it ended. Uh, I think it's still going. I could be wrong. I, I could have swore I read that it was like August 5th or something like that. So um, the Rushmore Criterion box is amazing. Uh, did you buy it on Criterion? No. Oh, I don't I, own it. I really desperately wanted to buy this on Criterion, even though I already own it, uh, because I love the box art for it. Uh, it's just, it's so great. Um, You're right. It's till August 6th. So ah. everybody, go give them your money. Yeah, if, if you were like, I don't know what to buy, but I really want to buy one, I say buy Rushmore because it's great. Um, it, it is a, it's Wes Anderson-style humor, so it is a little bit of a dry sense appeal at, at times. Um, I Man, this movie's so... Uh, I can't wait to watch it, Corey. I can't wait to talk to you next I'm week. I'm so excited that you're so excited. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I really do I mean, love this film. Um, it's, it's one of my fave... Uh, it's definitely... I think it is my favorite Wes Anderson film, although Grand Budapest is... I think Grand Budapest might be his best film. Um, I think Rushmore is still my favorite. Um, yeah. So, that'll be our next episode. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on Rushmore. You can email us, contact at BurkeReviews.com. Contact at BurkeReviews.com. Follow me on social media at BurkeReviews. And Corey. At Corey, R star, two R's on the end. 
And of course, you can read all of our reviews at BerkReviews.com, including listening to our other podcasts like the Bloody Awesome Movie Podcast that I do with Matt Hudson from uh, WhatIWatchTonight.co.uk, and our Top 5 Movie Podcast that we do with Corey, myself, and Michael Sanchez, um, and who knows what else, because there's other podcasts in the work. Um, I, you know, uh, What I Watch Tonight is a really great movie podcast that he, Matt does several several different uh themed episodes i do another one with him called movie astrology love for you to check any of those out and if you like any of what we do please share it tell your friends let people know that we exist uh the more listeners we get the bigger the show can be and the more likely we can give you even more episodes so i think that concludes this episode Corey. i hope you have a good week thanks you too bye guys and until next time folks keep watching movies This has been a Burke Reviews podcast, burkereviews.com.